speaker. So I'm uh, delighted to introduce Dr. Maria Adelaida Gomez, who is the coordinator of the Molecular Biology and Biochemistry Lab at CIDEIM in Cali, Colombia. Um, and she's also a Validate Network investigator. And Adelaida is working to uh, focus on the host pathogen interaction uh, and underlying mechanisms that uh, determine the outcome of human leishmania infections. Um, so Adelaida, without any further ado, really delighted to hand over to you and looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for your introduction and as well for the invitation to give this seminar. I already see familiar faces and friends, so hello to all. Um, I know that we have a short time today, so I am not going to go too, too deep into detail, but I want to have two accomplishments at the end of the talk. One, for you guys to know what is the aim and what we do in the context of neglected tropical disease research, and also to give you, of course, some insights in the way that we investigate uh, the therapeutic response and the immunological response in patients with cutaneous leishmaniasis and how from this context we derive uh, what we consider the immune profiles of healing and in that way to inform what to target and when. So um, just if, if someone, okay, I think it's, it's moving right. So CIDAIM is a center for biomedical research in Colombia. We are focused in research in neglected tropical diseases, and we have been a WHO collaborating center since 1992 in leishmaniasis. As you see in this image, basically our um, research plat platform uh, begins from basic research all the way to applied research, and most recently we have engaged into some um, research that involves the community and implementation as well. So uh, we try to uh, accomplish the whole circle of um, uh, research approaches towards biomedical and infectious disease research. We are located, as Helen was saying, in Cali, Colombia. We are a strategic ally of the Universidad Icesi, uh, but we're an autonomous research center and have been conducting research for the past 60 years. So uh, we have several lines of uh, focus. Uh, one of the major lines of research is leishmaniasis, and that's what we're going to be focusing our talk today. But we also conduct research in tuberculosis, in malaria, in some other bacterial infections, dengue, some herbovirology, just so that you um, keep in mind these things as well. And in addition of being a research center, we're also as well a training center. So we are a TDR WHO regional training center. And that basically means that we provide uh, training opportunities for uh, researchers, young and older, uh, in everything that has to do with tools and skills to develop um, uh, their research platforms. Uh, and we are focused in providing these uh, uh, training opportunities, not only to people in Colombia, but throughout the region of the Americas, Central and South American and the Caribbean. Um, so there are plenty of opportunities and you are able to see those type of opportunities in our webpage. Okay, so starting off with uh, the problem that gathers all us here, uh, we are working with cutaneous leishmaniasis. Colombia is the second country um, or second to Brazil in the whole of the Americas to report cases of leishmaniasis. In Colombia, we report more than 10,000 cases annually and more than 98% of these cases are cutaneous leishmaniasis. Uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis in Colombia is distributed basically throughout the country but more predominantly in the Pacific coast and the Amazon region here in the south. So what I bring here is a couple of images so that you can uh, give uh, an idea to yourself of the type of environments in which we are working. Uh, this is uh, a typical example of the type of patients that we see in the Pacific coast of Colombia. These are individuals that have to travel by boat uh, five to eight hours from their home to the nearest health post to be able to be diagnosed or treated for leishmaniasis. 
Um, and similarly, this case, for example, in this house, which is in the north of the country, uh, where houses may be one kilometer away from another. And so people also need to have um, quite a long distance of traveling before getting to the health post. We do a very strong interaction with the community. And so this is just a picture to show you um, the some of the community leaders with whom we work in the Pacific Coast. And this is a really nice interaction because it brings reality to, to our our research. So uh, you will you will hear me throughout the, the talk uh, talking about patients' lab and patients, and that's because our research really derives from the clinical observations, and then we bring this to the lab, and then we go back to the patient to try and give some implementable uh, approaches to mitigate the the disease. Um, all right. So in the context of cutaneous leishmaniasis, I wanted to uh, bring these pictures here. I'm not going to go too much into detail about the, the pathogenesis um, because this crowd is uh, quite acquainted with the disease. But what I wanted to, to focus in is that cutaneous leishmaniasis is actually a range of diseases. Uh, so you see that in um, people with cutaneous leishmaniasis in Colombia and throughout the Americas, you can have individuals that have infection but never develop uh, a symptomatic disease, which are individuals with asymptomatic infection. And within the symptomatic individuals, we also have... Sorry, can you turn off the mic? Whoever that is. So, within... Within the symptomatic. Hi, could, could people please go on mute if they're not speaking? Because there's a horrible amount of background noise. Could you, could you ever stop Blakey? Can you mute? Can you mute everyone, please? I'm I'm trying, but I can't seem to see who it is. Do two two seconds. All right. Sorry. No, 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 no worries at all. So uh, what I was saying is that within cutaneous leishmaniasis in Colombia and throughout the Americas, there is also a range, an important range of clinical manifestations. And within the symptomatic individuals, we can see that they can go from Oh, hang on, Maria's now gone muted. Blakely? <laughs> now, I think, okay, here we are. You're very tolerant. Yes, go back. <laughs> no, no, no. This happens. I mean, we have to get used to this for the past eight months. It's fine. Um, so um, uh, you also see this type of more severe manifestations like the one that you see uh, in this foot and as well uh, this image that depicts a patient with uh, mucosal compromise, which is as well a chronic manifestation of leishmaniasis. And these type of chronic manifestations tend to be much more difficult to control. One of the things that is very important to keep in mind is that leishmaniasis, the clinical manifestation of disease, is in fact the result of immunopathology. So it's triggered by the parasite, yes, but it's maintained by the host immune response. And therefore, understanding what contributes to this immunopathology is very important to know exactly what we want to trigger as a protective mechanism in terms of vaccine development or in terms of therapeutic development. So that's basically our, our task. Since I'm going to be focusing today in what constitutes a healing and a non-healing response, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about treatment as well. And we're going to see how this uh, merges into uh, the interest of this group. So uh, the treatment for leishmaniasis is in most of the Americas, antimonial drugs. And antimonial drugs are uh, given for 20 consecutive days. And uh, this is about for a person of, let's say, 70 kilograms, you will have around 10 ml of antimonials uh, given uh, intramuscularly to these individuals. So you can already imagine that this is a very difficult um, uh, treatment mechanism to maintain in these rural remote areas that I was uh, showing you at the beginning. We have a second line of treatment, which is miltefacine. Miltefacine is oral, so it is uh, much better in terms of um, uh, access and adherence. Uh, however, it has um, 
a level of treatment failure that is important between 15 and 40 percent, but this depends on the species that we're that we're de dealing with. Uh, similarly, in testimonials, there is a very high treatment failure rate, and and more important than this is as well the very high uh, rates of adverse drug reactions, which is really uh, not sustainable to control for for treatment of uh, pathology that is cutaneous and not necessarily life threatening. So that's um, basically the baseline for for our motivation to work on looking for better therapeutic uh, as well as control strategies. So as I was saying, we're going to focus in what constitutes a healing response, and to tackle this, I'm going to um, focus on on two, let's say, aspects of uh, healing. One what we think is therapeutically uh, induced healing, uh, which what we see here uh, um, in these pictures, basically uh, we have the spectrum from treatment cure to treatment failure. And what you see here are images, sequential images of uh, a lesion, a cutaneous lesion throughout the course of treatment. And you see how um, this lesion goes towards healing process uh, all the way to a scar. However, in individuals with treatment failure, this is precisely what we see, that the uh, healing process does not take place and we continue with an open wound uh, or signs of an inflammatory response in the lesion sites and uh, therefore that constitutes uh, a treatment failure. So, so we're going to call this a healing response and failure a non-healing response. Similarly, in the context of uh, the range of um, infection and disease or the spectrum of infection and disease. What we're going to consider a healing response are these uh, individuals with asymptomatic infection or self-healing uh, manifestations, meaning that the patient has come with a symptomatic uh, disease or a lesion, but without the um, drug treatment, they uh, spontaneously heal and that we will call a healing response or individuals with chronic and recurrent uh, manifestations. These are individuals that can have a lesion with a time of evolution of two years, three years, even 10 years. And so those are we're going to put into the other side of the spectrum, which we're going to call a non-healing response. So what I want to share with you today are examples of how we investigate host pathogen interactions in the context of therapy and in the context of um, the clinical course of uh, infection and disease, and how this informs what um, we consider can be um, framed as a healing response and as the target that we want to achieve uh, in terms of therapy and, and likely uh, vaccine development. So um, I'm going to start off by uh, giving you a couple of examples of uh, previous research and most um, other most recent uh, research results in the context of um, asymptomatic self-healing and chronic infections. So the first piece of data that I wanted to share was uh, a question that was asked several years ago by our scientific director, Nancy Sarabia. Many, maybe many of you um, know her. She has been a pioneer in Colombia working with uh, leishmaniasis and conducting leishmaniasis research. And basically what she asked was whether macrophages being um, the, the primary host cell for leishmania were more permissive to infection in those individuals that have clinical manifestations of chronic or recurrent infection. And so what you can see here in the green triangles are individuals with asymptomatic infection, uh, basically defined as a Montenegro skin test uh, positivity. In black individuals um, without infection, these are healthy donors. And in red, individuals with recurrent and chronic disease. And what we see is that those individuals that have more chronic manifestations have macrophages that are more permissive to infection, meaning that they have, first of all, more cells, more macrophages that were infected, and not only more macrophages that were infected in an in vitro assay, but also that have higher parasite loads within each of the, of the macrophages that was evaluated. So, uh, 
summary, these findings uh, suggest that infectivity and parasite survival is something that is uh, relevant to more chronic disease manifestations. However, it is important to keep in mind that this is something that occurs very early on. These are in vitro infections. And if you follow the leishmaniasis literature, you may be aware that patients with more chronic disease manifestations tend to have very low parasite loads in their lesions. And so most likely this is the reflection of the very early stages of disease or infection. And then uh, is the immunopathology which, which takes on uh, over the, the pathology itself. Okay, so um, one of the, the, the very classical experiments that is done in leishmaniasis and many other infectious diseases is to try and understand this uh, balance between pH1, pH2 responses, which has been informed by murine models for um, many, many years. And what is very clear is that in murine models of infection, we have uh, a TH1 response that is uh, very much associated with healing responses and a TH2 that is much associated with uh, non-healing responses. But the reality is that in human disease, this does not um, appear to be true. In um, human disease, what we see is that in individuals with chronic or recurrent infections here in purple and blue, there is a higher level of expression of both anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory cytokines compared to those individuals with asymptomatic infection or healthy controls. And this means that it's not necessarily skewing towards a TH1 or TH2 uh, phenotype, what uh, promotes uh, non-healing uh, non response, but most likely it is this magnitude of the inflammatory response, which is concordant with immunopathology driving disease. So, um, these are observations that have that have uh, uh, been uh, quite consistently, and over time we uh, consistently observe that individuals with more severe disease manifestations have a hyperinflammatory response, both uh, pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory, and that uh, this is seen not only in the periphery, so in PBMCs, but also in in the lesions of these patients. One of the things that we also asked was whether the parasite. So what we saw here is that the host itself may be driving what could constitute a, a healing or a non-healing response. But we asked, you know, there is a lot of diversity as well between the different strains of species of uh, leishmania in Colombia and in the world. And so we asked whether parasites isolated from individuals with chronic cutaneous leishmaniasis induced a different response in primary macrophages compared to parasites that were isolated from individuals that healed. And what you see here is that individuals that have um, the strains that are isolated from chronic patients are able to induce much stronger uh, levels of pro-inflammatory chemokines and cytokines compared to those that are isolated from self-healing individuals, meaning that in addition to specific host responses that are involved in uh, um, permitting or allowing this pro-inflammatory um, environment, there are parasite constituents that may be associated as well with induction of a stronger uh, inflammatory environment that may be uh, conducive to uh, more chronic or non-healing outcomes of cutaneous leishmaniasis. So this is what has to do with this um, uh, clinical spectrum of infection and disease. And then I'm just going to show you three examples of uh, some of the work that we do in the context of therapeutic response. So um, as you know, the therapeutic outcome in leishmaniasis as well as in many other intracellular infections is dependent on the interaction of the host, the pathogen and the drug. And so in this, in this context, our group has been very interested in understanding what is the relationship of the immunological response and the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, as well as drug resistance mechanisms that contribute to a uh, therapeutic outcome. So first question, is parasite elimination required for a healing response? And this comes from um, what I mentioned before as well, that in individuals with very severe cutaneous lesions, it is actually very difficult to find the parasite. Diagnosis is very complicated. And so it, it, it is kind of counterintuitive that you have 
very severe lesions, but not a lot of parasites in these lesions. And so in terms of treatment, this is we see something similar. This is a um, uh, 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 work that we did a couple of years ago where we were um, analyzing the frequency of parasite persistence in individuals with therapeutic cure. So um, this, is, this was a cohort of about 70 people that had cutaneous leishmaniasis, all who healed after treatment. And what we see in this graph here is that at the end of treatment, about 60% of individuals have molecular evidence of parasite persistence either in the lesion or in some mucosal tissues and 13 weeks after initiation of treatment meaning several months after uh, um, after treatment there is also a high frequency of individuals that have persisting parasites so what this tells us is that parasite elimination is important but it's not the unique thing that is required for healing responses and this is just an image to show you how um, a healing response in terms of treatment uh, is observed. Sometimes these scars are, are less, um, less evident. Okay, so uh, not only do we, we, we need yes, parasite uh, reduction of parasite burden, but we don't necessarily need parasite elimination. But what we do need is a uh, containment of the inflammatory response. So I'm not going to go through every single detail of this graph, but I just want to bring your attention to the fact that in individuals who cure, which are the first block of uh, graphs in each of the columns, we have a tendency of uh, much stronger downregulation of a lot of the inflammatory mediators uh, that we have surveyed in lesions of these patients compared to lesions of patients who fail to respond to treatment. So um, let's say the summary here is that in both treatment failure and treatment success individuals, what we have is a dampening of the inflammatory response after treatment. However, the magnitude of the downregulation of this inflammatory response is much stronger in individuals who cure than in individuals who fail. Uh, we uh, finished that work with uh, finding that levels of, of expression of CCL2 were potentially predictive of the therapeutic outcome. This is something that we're continuing to explore, but uh, this is uh, preliminary in the context that we have done this with a very small uh, patient population. This was about uh, 40 people, so uh, I'm not going to uh, just draw a lot of conclusions from this, but CCL2 may be an important driver of uh, therapeutic cure. And now this is one of the most exciting things that I wanted to share with you. This is a very recent study that we did. This was funded by the Wellcome Trust. And what we wanted to see here was how the immunological response throughout the course of treatment is modified so that we know when we need to intervene the inflammatory response to promote healing. And so what we did here was a, a parallel pharmacokinetic study with an uh, immunological study, so we call this immunopharmacokinetics, where we evaluated drug concentrations in plasma and in PBMCs of individuals undergoing treatment with antimonial drugs, and we trace the swell, the expression of several of these inflammatory mediators that we have been observing that are involved in therapeutic healing. All these individuals that participated in the study healed, and so this is, let's say, the portrait of uh, healing response in the context of therapy. So what we see here is that we have um, kind of clustered expression of several of these inflammatory mediators, most likely meaning co-regulation of these different mediators uh, during drug treatment. So you see that uh, just in the course of one day of treatment, this is a scale of 24 hours, you see a very rapid and coordinated modulation of the expression of some of these mediators. I'm not going to show you here the data, but in terms of pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, what we saw was a um, hysteresis relationship and that basically uh, means that it's not a lineal relationship in terms of drug concentration and modulation of the inflammatory response. But when you look further during the course of treatment, what we see is that these uh, inflammatory response have also uh, very coordinated waves. 
So what we see is that uh, genes that are involved in Th1 responses, for example, are uh, consistently induced by the end of treatment, and then they go back to basal levels. Uh, sorry, these are neutrophil, uh, neutrophil responses. Here in the middle, uh, we have the Th1 responses, which are strongly induced at the beginning of treatment. And at the end, we have induction of some of these pro-inflammatory receptors that activate um, monocytes and some innate cells that may be involved as well in this uh, uh, inflammatory response control. So uh, in general, what we um, retrieve from this information is that we do need pro-inflammatory responses for therapeutic healing and for healing responses in general. But what we need is really a very controlled inflammatory response to be able to result in a, a, a long-lasting uh, healing response. So basically with this, uh, I conclude uh, what I wanted to show you in this uh, very short minutes that we had, but essentially just going back to the initial question that I proposed in this um, talk, what is, it, what is an immunological profile of healing in cutaneous leishmaniasis and what do we need to target and when? And um, essentially the, the answer from the observations that we have is that uh, a non-controlled pro-inflammatory response is definitely uh, a response that is associated with pathology. A pro-inflammatory and early pro-inflammatory immune response is good for healing, but again, it has to be controlled and damp dampened so that the immunopathology is limited. And when to target this, I think this type of experiments give us a very good idea of when we want to give immunomodulators or when we want to give immunotherapy for this uh, um, type of responses to occur. So, for example, if we would like to have a, um, uh, the induction of a Th1 response, most likely it would be at the beginning of treatment instead of at the end of treatment and so on. So, these are uh, some of the work that, that we have done. This is a, a small example of the type of things that we do in Colombia. And uh, of course, this is not uh, uh, a work that we do alone. This is a work that we do with a whole bunch of people, both in Colombia and outside. Uh, this is past and previous, uh, sorry, past and current members of our team in Cali. We're a group of about 30 uh, investigators, some in training, some uh, uh, older, uh, but we all work collectively. Uh, this is, our, this is our, our community or part of our community with whom we work in the Pacific Coast. Uh, we have very strong collaborations with uh, people in different parts of the world. And I see uh, my colleague and friend Richard, I saw his face somewhere in the, in the audience. And so we have worked quite a lot with Richard trying to identify metabolic biomarkers of healing and protein biomarkers of healing. Um, and this, uh, this work has been funded for uh, years by the Wellcome Trust, by the NIH, uh, uh, the Colombian uh, government, as well as the Newton Fund. So I'm happy to take any questions. And once again, thanks to the Valdez Network for allowing me to present some of the data and for giving me the opportunity to share what we do in Colombia. <coughs> Excuse me. Blakely, do you want to share questions or shall I? Oh, no, I'm happy for you to, um, but I would just encourage people, if they're happy to, to turn on your um, cameras so we can say hello and see everybody. Um, but no, I'm very happy for you to, to chair the questions, Helen. Sure. No, well, I'm going to take chair's privilege then and start with one myself. So, so Adelaide, thanks. That was a lovely talk. I'm, I'm really fascinating. And I, I love the way you map the um, you mapped the course of the inflammatory response and related it to, to cure or not. And, and I think um, you know, it's a very nice way to really start to interrogate what's happening in, in those who cure. Uh, which I think you mean sterilize and, and those who don't. So um, can I ask you, you talked then about immunomodulation and of course, you know, this does allow you then the tools to rationally intervene either to enhance or to suppress the immune response, depending on what time you're doing that. Um, and are there any, um, I mean, I don't know how widespread in where Leash is endemic, the use of the, the new biologic agents and monoclonals are, but is there any data, you know, in tuberculosis, we learned the importance of 
of TNF most most or, or most beautifully from from the use of infliximab in people who were latently infected. Um, so I wonder if there are any natural experiments like that 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 help give us an insight that complements this kind of really comprehensive mapping that you've done. Sure. Thanks for the question. Uh, before I answer the question, I wanted to make just one comment. When you said healing, you said to sterilize. Ah, and yes. no, it is okay. not sterile. It, it's not sterile cure. So in cutaneous leishmaniasis, what we do is clinical observation of a healing response. So okay. basically, we have um, uh, lesion healing, no signs of inflammation, but a parasitological uh, outcome is never assessed. Okay. Different okay. visceral leishmaniasis where there is sterilization. Okay. So that's why I was a bit kind of. Uh, insistive in the fact that, you know, part of load is important, but it's not the unique. No, no, exactly. No, no, well, yeah. thank you for that clarification. That's sure. important. So, uh, and so uh, answering your question, yes, so there there have been experiments. Uh, I'm not sure if from nature, but nature-like, uh, and some other clinical trials that have uh, been uh, done to explore the use of immunomodulation uh, to promote healing. So, for example, in our experience, uh, we have done um, a combination clinical trial with pentoxifiline, alluding as well to TNF. So, the hypothesis there was that uh, more chronic disease is mediated by a strong pro-inflammatory response, and therefore having a TNF inhibitor most likely may be mediating um, a better course of treatment, maybe a, a, a faster cure, for example. And in our hands, we were not able to see any add-on effect of pentoxifiline, for example. Okay. Okay. But I can tell you that there, there, many years ago, and, and some of the Lichmaniasis colleagues here can complement this, there were um, very nice studies conducted by Dr. Convid in Venezuela, where he used BCG as okay, an yes. immunotherapeutic. Yes. And that was seen as a, a positive response towards a healing response. Really um, to be honest, I don't remember when was the immunotherapy given. Sure, I don't know the sure, during sure. the course of this disease, but it has been shown that it works. And some other studies with Imiqui mode as well. Like it is it is known. Now that's why I was so also intense with the fact of when is it that one need to give him money exactly, modulation? Exactly. Because if we were to give pro-inflammatory immunomodulation at the end, for example, I think that that would be a bad thing. Completely the wrong. No, no. I, well, that's <laughs> that's why the studies that you're doing are important to be able to time the therapy. No, no, that's really interesting. Paul, I can see Paul K. Of, of course, has a has a question or a comment. Paul. Hi, Helen. Hi, Adelaide. Lovely, Paul. lovely talk. Lovely talk. Um, the kinetics of change of chemokine expression following drug intervention was very rapid. Um, yeah. Do you know what the kinetics of parasite kill is in relation to the pharmacology? OK, this is or really good Do you think question. this is true immunomodulation by, by antimonials? So two, two parts of the question. I do think it's a true immunomodulation by antimonials because we see this as early as 30 minutes after dose. So these experiments, well, experiments, no, sorry. These uh, assays are done with uh, individuals with a cathete catheter. And so yep. once we give the dose, we take blood samples, 30 minutes, one hour, two, five, two, three, five, eight hours, and 12 hours. And as early as half an hour after dose, we see already the, the uh, some of these chemokine and cytokine genes being modulated. So I think it's something that is receptor based and that's the next, I mean, that's the question that I want to address, but we'll see. Um, then uh, in terms of kinetics of parasite kills. So this is another aspect of the work that we do. This is uh, led by um, Nancy and uh, we are currently doing uh, a work funded by NIH where we are trying to tackle whether this um, let's say the same argument that is using bacteria of rapid parasite kill is what can be associated with a healing response. So I can tell you that the first experiments that were done were to analyze the, uh, the drop in the parasite burden after eight days of treatment. And at eight days of treatment in the lesion, parasite burden was already undetectable. 
Then we move to three days of treatment. At three days of treatment, most of them is undetectable. Now, my perception is that, yes, throughout the course of treatment, most likely this is going to be undetectable, but as soon as you stop treatment, this is going to come back quite a bit. If it's controlled, no problem. If it's not controlled, then it's a problem. Well, that's just my hypothesis. Okay. <laughs> Good luck testing that one. <laughs> <laughs> Very I interesting. I'll, I'll, I see Alvaro now has his hand up. Alvaro? Yes, hi, hi. Um, hi. Um, I really like your, your talk, uh, Maria Delaida. Um, Thank you, sir. I have two questions in relation to the uh, lack of response or delayed response from, the, from treated patients. So one is in relation to a different vectors that might be uh, involved in transmission. And the second one is in relation to um, when this RNA, RNA virus came out and involved in metastasizing and involved in treatment response, I don't know in terms of uh, treatment, you know, what's the participation uh, of it? And the other aspect is skin microbiota. Have you looked into skin microbiota <laughs> also affecting that? Thank you. Yes, very interesting questions as well. So um, let's start with the, I don't remember the first, but I'll tackle on the virus because that goes immediately to my head. Yeah. So, yeah, the vectors, oh, the vectors, yeah, the, first the one. first vector, yeah. vector, yeah. So, uh, in terms of vectors, I'm, I'm really not the best person to ask. Uh, I know that we have quite a bit of diversity of vectors in Colombia, but the majority of the of the patients that we see here are patients with Leishmania panamensis infection, and uh, from a very specific area of the country. And so, I don't think that in terms of that much vector diversity we're going to have a lot in that context. But again, I, I would prefer not to comment that much because I really just don't know that much. Uh, I was going to say, you know, I'm sorry if my cat comes, but now I see you. Uh, so, well, in terms of uh, virus, so we have actually done, and I hope we can publish this soon, a very thorough and quite comprehensive analysis of uh, detection of virus in, in our strain collection. So, so far we have analyzed about 100 different Leishmania panamensis strains isolated from different parts of the country and we have not seen a single strain with the virus. So, at least for Leishmania panamensis, I would say that there is no involvement of the virus in the, in the therapeutic or immunological outcome. And then, uh, can you remind me of the last one? Skin microbiome, any, any oh. correlation with the secondary yes, infections? Yes. Yeah, so we have not done it. I hope we could. And actually, I, 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 I talked with, uh, with uh, um, Najib El Sayed, who's the person that we collaborate very much in transcriptomics. Yeah. He said, we have already a lot of transcriptomic data from the skin biopsies. Like, no, 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 you're not going to catch it because poly A. So anyway, I hope, we hope that we can do that. Uh, I'm, I'm mentioning because we, we did it uh, uh, with patients infected with major and tropica, and we, we look into the 16S, and, and there are two differences when, when the patients develop, uh, when they become uh, dysbiotic, for example, they become cool. more refractory to treatment compared to those that have a high diversity, for example. So I wonder whether in, in a, a American Ishmanisis will, will happen something similar that we see in the old world. And, yeah, and I'm happy I... to talk to, if you want to go on, on, on that, that route Super. as well. Excellent, thank you. Okay, thank you. Really interesting. Thanks, Alvaro. Um, okay, I now can see Hero has her hand up. Hero, hello. Oh, uh, I would like to know how frequent, uh, uh, how the frequency of uh, self cure patient also the. Uh, mucocutaneous, uh, mucocutaneous patients because depend on the area have uh, much more than and the Colombia actually I don't know how often they are. Sure, sure. So in terms of mucocutaneous, I would say that it will not surpass two to three percent of the cases of the total leishmaniasis cases in the country. So we do have mucosal disease, but it's uh, it's not that much. And it's primarily associated with Leishmania brasiliensis in the Amazonian region. 
Um, now, in terms of self-healing, that is a very interesting question that unfortunately we cannot ask anymore because it's unethical to leave the patients without treatment. But I can give you some insights from some epidemiological work that has done has been done years ago. Um, well, years ago, and actually, from a study, this is this is not like analyzed data, but it's data that I have in my head from a study that involved about 40 different cutaneous leishmaniasis patients, I can tell you that we have about 10 different strains from individuals that had self-healing lesions. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that the frequency is very low uh, because more recently we had done a uh, epidemiological survey in the north part of the country and in the south and when we came to the north area of, of, of Colombia, uh, in this community in Risaralda, uh, we assessed the whole community to see who of these individuals had um, typical scars of leishmaniasis and who had Montenegro skin test positivity. And about 70% of those individuals manifested to have previous episodes of leishmaniasis. And Many of them, I cannot give you a number, but many, many of them did not receive treatment. So my take on that is that the frequency of self-healing leishmaniasis in Colombia is variable depending on the region and most likely depending on the, uh, the, the pathogenicity of the strains that are circulating in the different regions. Do you see, uh, and the immune response, have you done any uh, studies on the uh, immune profile of these patients no, unfortunately, to the disease? Unfortunately not. Our, our major area of influence is the South Pacific area of Colombia. So these are these are the, these are the people in the community that we work with the most. Uh, it would be super interesting to do a comparative analysis with individuals in the in the north, but we have not done any of that. OK, thank you. Thank you. Super. Well, Adelaide, I think we probably should draw it to a close, but I suspect some of us could could listen to you talk for quite a long time. And uh, it's been really interesting. Thank you so much for giving such a, a great talk uh, and um, really, you know, to finish off our year love, uh, really, really nicely. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for listening. Uh, and thank you to Blakely as ever for organising all of this.